In every living thing, there is some instrument of guidance. The birds travel thousands of miles and come back to the same place. The bat, blindfolded, can fly between iron bars without touching them. And they say that it is impossible to lose a homing pigeon. Has man alone been set adrift without some inner compass? Is that why millions turn to the daily horoscope for guidance? Or to the fortune teller? To those who read the palm, the tea leaf, or the crystal ball? Is that why we're so quick to follow a leader, even if the leader cannot see? is written. This is George Vandeman. Today, It Is Written presents Sometimes You Lead a Prophet. Did you ever hear of the processionary caterpillar? Jean Henry Faber made a special study of this particular caterpillar and found it very, very interesting. It seems that this caterpillar wanders around aimlessly, pursued by many followers who move when he moves, stop when he stops, and eat when he eats. Pine needles are their principal source of food. Well, one day Faber tried an experiment. He filled a flower pot with pine needles, which they love, and then lined up the caterpillars in a solid ring around the rim of the pot. Sure enough, they began to move slowly round and round the rim, each following the one ahead, and yes, you guessed it. They continued this senseless revolving for seven days, never once stopping for food, until one by one they began to collapse. And Margaret Abelgarth, who tells the story, remarks significantly that the woods are full of processionary caterpillars uncannily like people you and I know. Yes, we spend a good deal of time just following the leader. Could that be one reason that Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd, referred to his people as sheep? Sheep are followers, you know. Jesus once said concerning the Pharisees of his day, as found over there in Matthew 15, verse 14. Matthew 15, verse 14. Listen to what he said. He said, Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind guide leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Yes, following the leader may be all right sometimes, but what if the leader can't see? Then we have a problem, don't we? Most of you are probably somewhat familiar with the writings of Bruce Barton, the author of the book, The Man Nobody Knows. But you may not be acquainted with the writings of his father, William B. Barton. Well, here's a gem from his pen. And I want you to hear it just as he wrote it. We sojourned in Egypt, he says, I and Keturah, and we rode on donkeys and also on camels. Now, of all the beasts that were ever made, the camel is the most ungainly and preposterous and also the most picturesque, and he taketh himself very seriously. Then he goes on, And we beheld a string of five camels that belonged to one caravan, and they were tethered every one to the camel in front of him, but the foremost of the camels had on a halter that was tied to the saddle of a donkey. And I spake to the man of Arabia who had the camels, and I inquired of him how he managed it. And he said, each camel followeth the one in front and asketh no questions. And I come up after and prod up the last camel. And he said, Doth not the first camel consider that there's no other in front of him but only a donkey? And he answered, Nay, for the first camel is blind and knoweth only that there's a pull at his halter. And every other animal follow, followeth as he is led. And I prod up the hindermost one. Then I inquired about the donkey, 
And he said, well, the donkey is too stupid to do anything but keep straight on. And he hath oft been over the road. And I said unto Keturah, behold, a picture of human life. For on this fashion have the processions of the ages largely been formed. For there be few men who ask otherwise than how the next in front is going. And they blindly follow each in the track of those who have gone before. And Keturah said, but how about the leader? And I said, that's the most profound secret of history. For often he who seemed to be the leader was really behind the whole procession. Is any comment needed? It's easy to follow a magnetic personality, one who speaks smooth things and makes us feel good about ourselves. And that smooth talking leader may be as blind as that lead Campbell, and the donkey may be headed straight for the ditch or even for Jonestown. What we need is a real, live prophet. A prophet, you know, is sometimes called a seer. A seer, one who can see. That's what the Bible says. A prophet is delegated, you see, by God to be the eyes of the church. It was Solomon, the wise man, who said, over here in Proverbs 29, verse 18, Proverbs 29, that wise book, Proverbs 29, 18, the wise man said, where there is no vision, see, the people perish. And then listen to this. Listen to this over in 2 Chronicles 2.20. 2 Chronicles 2.20. All fits together magnificently as God's Word always does. Look, have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in His prophets and you will be successful. Have faith in His prophets. It just isn't safe to go blindly along following our noses, carrying out a path that seems right to us. It's so easy to be wrong. Listen to this. Listen to this. Proverbs 14, 12 again. Let's go right back to those sayings. Proverbs 4, 14, 12. Yes. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. Now, does this mean that we're left to blunder along, doing what seems right to us and continually making mistakes? No. Here's the promise. This time, let's go to the Psalms. Psalm 32, verse 8. Psalm 32, verse 8. Listen to this. Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct thee, says God. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Yes, he'll instruct us. He'll teach us. His eye will be upon us. But since a prophet is given to be the eyes of the church, of his people, could it not also mean that he'll guide us through the counsels of his prophets? Look, I will guide thee or guide you with my eye. Certainly, that is one of the ways God has chosen, one important instrument of his guidance down through the centuries. Ancient Babylon didn't need a prophet. Certainly not. One who spoke for the God of the Hebrews. Were not the gods of Babylon superior to all other gods? Did not Babylon have the finest of astrologers and magicians and various other wonder workers, loosely known as wise men? Was not this great Babylon, ruler of the world, the kingdom that would endure forever? So Babylon thought and Babylon planned. But Babylon would need a prophet, and soon it would need a prophet desperately. The king would soon have a strange dream, and not one of his boasted counselors could make any sense out of it. A hand would then one day write in letters of fire upon the palace wall, and none but a prophet of God would be able to read those fiery words. Listen. A thousand miles away from the proud city, a teenager was growing straight and tall, never dreaming what God had in mind for him. I wonder what he was like. I wonder if his father helped him fly kites in the March wind. And I wonder if 
His father taught him the truth that a poet of modern times would put into rhyme. Boys flying kites haul in their white-winged birds. You can't do that when you're flying words. His father must have taught him that a man's destiny may depend upon his ability to say no. His mother must have told him more than once the story of Joseph, the boy who was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. She must have told him how Joseph, far from home, in a strange land where no one knew him, still refused to sin against his God. Yes, the boy must have had wonderful parents. He must have been an even, uh, and, and even, he must have even seen and shared their sadness as neighbors and friends turned from their loyalty to their God and began to worship the senseless gods of the heathen. And then one day when he was about 17, suddenly it happened. He, like Joseph, found himself a captive on the way to a strange land. You see, the king of Babylon had laid siege to, siege to Jerusalem, and to show his power and his special disdain for the God of Israel, he took some of the sacred vessels from the temple, and he took captive some of the finest young people, young men of royal line, secretly, of course, delighting in the thought that he would soon have them worshiping the gods of Babylon. And yes, his name was Daniel. And he was being forced to march with the Chaldean army a thousand miles to Babylon. But the king was to be disappointed in some of his plans. For by the time the army came in sight of the ruins of the Tower of Babel, Daniel and three of his friends had determined not to compromise. They'd be true to their God, come what may. And the first test was not long in coming. King Nebuchadnezzar determined to prepare the finest of the Hebrew captives to serve in his court. They were to have the very best education. And as a special favor to them, they were to have the same food that was prepared for the king's table. Wonderful, you say. Ah, but there was a problem. Some of the food and wine prepared for the king had been offered to Babylon's idols. To eat that food would be considered an act of communion with those strange gods. Daniel and his friends couldn't do that without denying the God of heaven. And there was another problem. These fine young men had been taught that a simple, non-stimulating diet would give them clearer minds and better health. And certainly, if they wanted to stand against the temptations of this wicked city, they'd near need clear minds. Now, true, it seemed a little thing, inconsequential. Wasn't it more important not to, defend, not to offend the king right at the beginning by refusing his favors? But Daniel and his friends recognized what was involved. Daniel, as spokesman for the four, tactfully asked and was granted permission to eat the simple food to which they were accustomed. And they came through with flying colors. You read the story in the first chapter of Daniel's book. Well, so began their education in a strange land. And while they were learning the Chaldean language and being prepared for positions of, in Babylon's court, God was preparing Daniel to be his prophet. Now, why had God arranged to place a prophet in the court of Babylon, the great center of pagan worship? What did he have in mind? Well, first of all, God loved Babylon, just as he loves every wicked city. He loved the king. You see, God had intended that Israel should be a light to the surrounding nations. But Israel, as a nation, had miserably failed. Instead of winning its neighbor, nations to the worship of the true God, Israel itself had been the one that was influenced. Israel itself had gone tramping after forbidden gods. And so now, through these faithful Hebrew captives, God intended to accomplish what Israel had failed to accomplish. Babylon was to see what God is like. The pagan capital would see that God is not like the heathen gods that had, been, had to be bribed and appeased. Rather, he's a God of love. He is aware of everything that happens to his children. 
He's a God willing to come down personally and deliver them or walk with them through the fire. The book of Daniel, my friend, toward the close of the Old Testament, is an absolutely fascinating book. It's full of deliverances. It tells how God delivered Daniel from the hungry lions and his friends from an overheated furnace. And it tells how Jesus would come to deliver his people from their sins, all in Daniel. And it tells of a time, still future, when God's people will be delivered from the worst time of trouble this world has ever known. And did you know that the book of Daniel, did you know that the book of Daniel is a Christ-centered book? It is. One of its prophecies written centuries before the birth of Jesus predicted the exact year in which Jesus would begin his public ministry, in the time of the crucifixion. It's a prophecy that gives mathematical proof that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And that same prophecy tells us what Jesus is doing right now in our day. Well, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, though written centuries apart, are inseparably tied together. Both are written especially for our day. Down here in the end of time, Daniel and John, the author of Revelation, both were visited by the angel Gabriel, heaven's highest angel, and both Daniel and John in vision actually saw Jesus. Do you see, begin to see why you personally need the book of Daniel? Need to understand it. Could anything better prepare you for the crises that soon we will all face? Tell me, would you have the courage to stand alone as Daniel and his friends did, risking the displeasure of the king and even their lives? And let me ask you another question. If God wanted to prepare you to stand in a great crisis, how do you think he'd go about it? Well, you say, I suppose he'd give me some little tests along the way. And you're exactly right. You see, it's the little tests along the way that determine how we'll do in the big crises. For if we always take the easy way, the popular way, in everyday decisions, we'll do the same thing in a crisis. We form the habit. And we aren't likely to change it then. If Daniel and his friends had failed that first test, though on the surface it appeared to be just a little thing, a matter of no consequence, what would have happened? Most likely we would have never heard of a prophet Daniel or of his deliverance from hungry lions. We would never have heard of his three friends, how the Son of God personally walked with them in the flames. This world and Babylon and you and I would have lost so much if that first test had failed. We're richer because four young men had the courage to say no. Would you like to have that kind of courage? It can't be purchased over the counter, my friend. It can't be generated by the power of the will. It's a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ, and it can be yours just now as you listen to this. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might see. And the light Shines in darkness now will safely lead us o'er if it wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would be no more. I thank God for the lighthouse, I owe my life to Him. Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, He has shown a light around me that I might clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? 
Everyone that lives about us says Tear that old lighthouse down The big ships don't sail this way anymore There's no use, it's standing round Then my mind goes back to a stormy night When just in time I saw the light The light from that old lighthouse That stands there on the hill I thank God for the lighthouse I owe my life to Him Jesus is the lighthouse And from the rocks of sin He has shown a light around me that I might clearly see If it wasn't for my Jesus Tell me where would this life be? Thank you, Marilyn Cotton. Shall we pray? Please, dear God, as we turn our attention to the book of Daniel, we see your hand directing in our lives, and we see the beautiful, appealing Savior that Daniel's predictions reveal. Who needs a prophet? We do, Lord. And a world in serious trouble needs a prophet, too. Thank you for the book of Daniel, and thank you for the Savior it reveals in your name. We pray. Amen. I'm Roland Lenhoff. In a moment, our prayer alert feature for today. Today's telecast focused on the Old Testament prophet Daniel. Because of this, it wasn't a bit difficult deciding what our gift for you today should be. The book Hammers in the Fire. Hammers in the Fire is full of fascinating information about the Bible, how it is being vindicated by the archaeologists with their spades, how the rocks back up the story of the Genesis flood, and how even the common honeybee poses some difficult questions for those who doubt the Bible account of creation. In a moment, we'll tell you where to phone or write. As you know, we offer a number of books on this telecast from time to time, and so if you write instead of phone, be sure to ask for the book by name, Hammers in the Fire, so that we'll send you the right book. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, and the zip is 91360. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week at this same time on this station. Thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your liberal support, which is so necessary in a television ministry like It Is Written. The address again is George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, and the zip is 91360. Remember, our offer for this week is Hammers in the Fire. Let me take this opportunity to thank you for your prayers and your financial support. Your contributions help us to present these messages every week. Again, here is Pastor Vandeman. Please let me add my thanks for your generous support and for your earnest prayers for the work of this telecast ministry. It's time now for our prayer alert feature for today. We have with us today the president of a movement with a worldwide constituency of three and a half million people. What does he draw on for wisdom and strength to meet the heavy day-by-day -day demands of his leadership? We'll discover that today on Prayer Alert. Joining hands across the miles, it is written's family of prayer 
and circle of caring. Prayer alert. Pastor Wilson, as president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, you oversee a Christ-centered movement which through medical, publishing, educational work, radio and television, and various other ways, aggressively is reaching to about 200 countries of the world. Is that right? That is correct. Now, you're constantly chairing committees, filling speaking appointments, writing articles, traveling, taking telegram, telephone, telex messages from various parts of the world, having to give counsel, having to make important decisions. I, along with many others who know you, marvel as to how you find the physical and mental stamina to face these kinds of demands day in and day out. How do you do it? Well, every morning does confront me with a variety of complex problems, financial, organizational, institutional, personnel, political and spiritual, for which there seem to be no good human solutions. But I also wake up each morning with the assurance that God has given me a new opportunity to experience a dimension in the dynamic of prayer. And he has invited me to consecrate myself to him in the morning and to make this my very first work, to lay all my plans at his feet, to be carried out or given up as he shall indicate. And it's just simply marvelous to see how he works. And at the end of each day, I say to myself, Lord, why did I even question this morning that you had a solution through the dynamic of prayer? I'm sure that there are many viewers who are watching today that are facing so many pressures and problems piling upon them that they just don't know where to turn. What would you say to such an individual? I understand your question. I have what I believe will be a beautiful and simple formula. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to open heaven's storehouse. We've appreciated so much the growing number of individuals who are becoming partners with us in this prayer alert ministry. If you would like to join this number, write to us here at It Is Written. Write to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. For those who write, we are going to send you Pastor Vandeman's book, Unlocking Heaven's Storehouse. And now, back again to Pastor Vanderman. And now the time has come all too quickly to say, goodbye everyone. But remember it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.